Something amazing happens when two teams hate each other enough. It doesn't happen often, but occasionally you'll see something so fascinating that you are forced to confront the reality of what it is you're watching. From the play that knocked out Stanford's band, to Colorado's infamous fifth down, to whatever BS Auburn has planned for that week, college football is filled with absurd occurrences that you either adore or despise. Everyone has their favorite. This is the story of mine. We begin in a Florida before the U storm the echelons of college football. Before Bobby Bowden's decades-long project to build Florida State began, and before both Spurrier the coach and Spurrier the player. All that's here is the University of Florida and the University of Miami, fighting over a peninsula no one really cares about. This is decades before Florida's population boom, with the Sunshine State having a population comparable to Colorado. In these early years, both programs found themselves far from the heights they'd one day reach. Florida in particular had it rough, struggling to lead the bottom half of a conference it helped found. And while Miami had some considerable early success, they'd be similarly shackled by their state's small size, a status quo that'd continue until the end of World War II. The 50s were a watershed moment for the two programs as both universities took full advantage of Florida's post-war population boom. More people and cash than ever before were flowing into Gainesville and Miami, and their football programs blossomed as a result. Miami became a top 20 team, and Florida was both competitive in the SEC and, for the first time in program history, a bowl in fatigue. As both programs grew, their series would in tandem, culminating in a top 20 1956 matchup, the first of its kind. As these programs were evolving, something else was beginning to occur. Miami was winning. A lot. While Florida dominated the early years of the series, since the end of the Second World War, the Hurricanes held a clear advantage of their older sibling. And sure enough, in this pivotal first-ranked matchup, Miami would clean house 20-7. Even as the 50s progressed into the 60s and Florida's first great field general and Heisman took to the field, little would change. Through this competitiveness, this series of mere convenience began to gain some animosity. He had to take a spark to truly heat up the interstate rivalry. A spark that would come in 1971. We like to throw and catch the football. We prefer to throw the football about 18 times ball game. The Gators are entering this game with a number of goals, the first of which revolves around QB John Reeves. Reeves is at the doorstep of Stanford QB Jim Plunkett's NCAA record for career passing yards. And this matchup against Miami is his final opportunity to take it home. Florida is also attempting to finish out a brutal losing season on a high note, and avenge a close home loss against Miami the previous year. The Gator offense would start out strong, with Reeves well on his way to get the 343 required yards to break the record. By halftime, the Gators would see themselves up 17 to nothing, and by the end of the fourth, their lead would expand to 38 to eight. When punt returner and defensive captain Harvin Clark returned a Miami punt all the way to the end zone, with Reeves 14 yards away from the passing record. Had he signaled a fair catch, Reeves would have likely had the chance to break the record right then and there, but the desire to stop Miami took precedence. After realizing what he'd done, he'd apologized to an unbothered Reeves. After all, there was just enough time for the Gator offense to take the field one more time. One more long pass should do it. The record was as good as... <sighs> Miami picked off the ball. And with little left on the clock, the Hurricanes are free to run out the clock and prevent their rival's QB from etching his name in the record book on their own field. Sensing Miami was likely just going to keep the clock running, Clark called a timeout to try to convince Florida head coach Doug Dickey to just let Miami score. To which he said no. So, Clark called another timeout asked again, and Dickey, again, said no. Then Clark called yet another timeout, to which Dickey responded with an emphatic, all right. Clark then took to the field, went back into the huddle, and devised a plan to get Reeves those last 14 yards. <laughs> ¶¶ 
There were many emotions in that moment. Some on both sides were embarrassed, some were completely livid, but most were just in shock, including Reeves himself. After Miami ran it in for an extra point, the Florida offense was back on the field. And after an incompletion, Reeves found his partner in crime on second down, receiver Carlos Alvarez, and broke Plunkett's record. The game concluded with celebration on the Florida sidelines with players diving into Miami's pool, the habitat for the Miami Dolphins live mascot, and Miami's head coach Franz Cersei refusing Dickey's hand. He was absolutely appalled at the classless display he was forced to observe. Even more enraged was Miami's defensive back, Burgess Owens, who reportedly broke his clavicle trying to pummel a Florida receiver into the turf on the play right before the record-breaking pass. Some Gators, particularly Alvarez, would blame the Miami offense for refusing to move, thus forcing the defense to play dead. To which Miami players responded with, that's a load of bullshit, and your record is tainted. No matter who the blame fell upon, the Hurricanes would leave the Orange Bowl bitter, and any mutual respect left between the two programs quickly faded away. That he didn't approve of the way his team let Miami score certainly doesn't seem consistent with most of the football coaches I've known. That maneuver last night has to tarnish the image of anyone associated with football at the University of Florida, and if that's an example of the type of sportsmanship taught by college football programs at this state's university, then maybe the sport should be de-emphasized. While the emotions lingered, the play itself was not a signifier for what was to come in the long term. The 1971 game would kick off a seven-game win streak for Florida, the longest streak in the series, but the Gators would regress, culminating in a winless 1979 season and a complete program overhaul. Florida would then see a resurgence in the early 80s, do a little bit of cheating, win the SEC for the first time in program history, do it again, get caught for doing a little bit of cheating, and begin to, yet again, regress until the Spurrier era began in 1990. For Miami, the Gator flop and subsequent seven-game losing streak would be one of many embarrassments to face their program throughout the 70s, bringing the Hurricanes to the brink of being shuttered. Then, in a Hail Mary hire, they would bring Howard Schnellenberger to the program, who would almost single-handedly bring Miami back from the dead and towards winning the state of Florida's first national title, forever putting to rest the notion of a Miami without the Canes. And then there's the man this was all for. Reeves' record of 7,549 career passing yards would be held until 1978, when it was broken by Washington State QB Jack Thompson. In the end, his record was never built to last, with the passing game evolving at a breakneck pace. But he was compensated with a fruitful 15-year-long career as an NFL, and briefly USFL, journeyman, before ending up back in Gainesville as Spurrier's QB coach. And, on an only slightly unrelated note, he'd also be the father-in-law to Ole Miss head coach and perennial shit Lane Kiffin for a bit. At the end of the day, this 1971 game and the play that capped it off, amounted to little more than two teams fighting for a less embarrassing losing record, and a QB hunting for a record that's been long since overtaken. But, that's not why this play is remembered today. Before 1971, the Miami-Florida game was an annual season closer and not much else. Two local teams scrapping for bragging rights. Nothing was the same after this beautifully classless display. It was a match that lit a fire of hatred that even after the Gators and Hurricanes stopped playing regularly, refuses to die. It summed the first fireworks for Floridian college football, a three-way rivalry that had come to define the next two decades of the sport. <laughs>